uh, excuse me, but this Quran burning, uh, uh, was it uh, constructed by the interests of Turkey uh, on purposefully, or is it something uh, really uh, out of uh, Swedish society? Is is it some something huh. uh, what what would be constructed in the Russian style? You know, we, <laughs> we don't want Sweden to be a NATO member, therefore we will find the cause. I mean, there, there were a lot of conspiracy theories in, 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 those, uh, as in, in the Turkish direction and, of course, in the Russian direction, uh, because uh, the Rus the Russia would win out from, from this particular uh, happening. But uh, it's it's difficult to say. The the guy who burned the Quran is uh, Rasmus Paluda and is Danish-Swedish, half Danish, half Swedish. It's a right-wing radical, I think you have to say, you know, this particular variety where the only thing they talk about is Islam. Uh, they don't even talk about immigration in general, they talk about Muslims and Islam. Then again, Muslims, Islam, Muslims, Islam. Uh, and he, he is, the Americans would say that he's a one-trick pony. Like, he, he, he does one thing. I mean, if you invited him to Kaunas, you maybe you wanted to talk, have an intellectual conversation with him. No, he wouldn't get one. He would burn a Quran because that's what he does, right? So, so he he, he was invited, um, and uh, to, to Sweden. It's it's not really clear how how that happened, um, and and uh, he did he he did his thing, you know. Uh, and there was then a debate in Sweden about freedom of speech. I mean, few people. Uh, saw this as a sound development, as a good thing to do. And there is no, I mean, people have various opinions about migrants and about Islam and about, but, but there, there is no strong Swedish uh, opinion who would support someone burning the Quran. It's seen as, you know, so it's, 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 it's a bit uh, um, outside of the normal, the normality, normal spectrum, so to speak. Niklas, uh, there I think we, uh, we need to explain a little bit for Lithuanian and other audiences about a multicultural situation in Sweden mm -hmm. because somebody could start to believe, you know, that uh, probably this is, you know, some uh, strong uh, movements of nationalists, you know, national socialists in Sweden. But I've seen a lot of mosques, uh, endless of Muslims, uh, yeah. you know, m many of uh, different faces and nations. It's uh, probably one of the most successful multicultural society in the world, you know, and it's very strange to listen to this, you know, accusation about uh, Swedish fascism, you know, or yeah. some kind of terrorism. This is very strange. And yeah. could you explain this multicultural situation in Sweden? Yeah, it's, 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 a, it's a very complex, complex thing, of course. Now, this was actually really done by an Islamophobic uh, Swedish-Danish actor, yes. But but the level of support for this guy is very low, as you indicate maybe in in in, in your question, right? Uh, so I would I, I'm not I wouldn't be that sure that this is one of the most successful multicultural countries in the world. Uh, we have huge problems with uh, integration, with long term unemployment, with people quite a lot of people still uh, even not being able to to read and write uh, from some certain countries, right? And um, we have huge tensions, uh, and I think it's it's a fairly. I mean, all major political parties nowadays, I think you can say they agree that we have made mistakes, that we we, we were too generous, we took in more people uh, than we really were able to to handle. But that being said, uh, the mainstream opinion still is that we should be a multicultural society. We should not return to some kind of m m monocultural uh, Sweden that existed before, with all its advantages and, and minuses. You know, uh, so most people, then m m most uh, political parties, at least, then among the, pub the general public, you can you can have various various opinions on that one. Uh, Sweden is is fairly liberal, uh, I, I think, uh, but. To a large extent, I think ethnic, uh, ethnic relations, if we take the Swedish majority uh, and say the groups that align, live together with this, with this majority, uh, that's one thing. But then we have the suburbs, the, then we have the uh, arid the districts where you have mainly and non-European population, Middle East, North Africa, basically, right? And, um, there, there is not there is segregation. 
that there is really a clear segregation. Uh, so I, 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 um, so although this guy was not supported, uh, there is something to play on, and there are potential conflicts in terms of criminality, in terms of social welfare, and so on. Now, <clears throat> may I shift our conversation uh, more towards uh, Ukraine? Uh -huh. uh, we we are witnessing uh, um, now the war full scale. Uh, hopefully, that uh, Ukrainian army will succeed uh, chasing out of uh, Ukraine's uh, land yeah. uh, Russian army. But I remember our conversation uh, uh, just before the war started. And mm -hmm. we were kind of um, optimistic that Russia will not dare yeah. to invade uh, Ukraine because uh, there will be economic san sanctions, its reputation globally yeah. will go down. Yeah. Yeah. And we, the feeling in our conversation uh, before the war started was uh, slightly optimistic that Russia will not be so insane. And now we see that um, uh, it really shocked the world with the level of cruelty. Uh, mm -hmm. Would you say that uh, now Ukrainians uh, who were divided uh, ethnically as uh, Russian-speaking uh, Ukrainians versus Ukrainian-Ukrainian-speaking uh, and the regional diversity, would you say that more or less uh, uh, the nation is united? Because there are still so there are some, as Russians say, полезные idioti, useful idiots, mm -hmm. who are not paid by Kremlin propaganda, but they do speak exactly what Kremlin propaganda is want. And we have uh, such people in Latvian Russians, in Lithuanian Russians, those полезные uh, idioti. Uh, uh. But uh, aside that, would you see, uh, because you, you travel a lot to Ukraine, you live there, uh, would you say that now Ukrainians are united one nation? Well, uh, firstly, I think uh, many people in Russia, the Russian regime, very, very much would like that decision to invade not to have happened. I mean, they have uh, our uh, optimism uh, would have been a much better part for Russia itself. Uh, now, they, 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 now they put themselves in, in, in this very difficult situation because of this. I think that Ukraine, I, mean, I think that Ukraine, the Ukrainian society as of now uh, is as united as it could be probably in, 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 in this situation. Uh, I think that since, since 2014, not only 2022, but 2014, uh, there has been, and we can see this also in, in, in gallops and in, 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 in research about public opinion, that um, Ukrainian national identity, not necessarily ethnic identity, but national identity, is is, is growing in importance in uh, also in in southern and eastern Ukraine. Although we should we should remember that this is a very this is one name for for very different reasons. Kherson has always been more Ukrainian speaking and say pro-Ukrainian in that sense than, for example, Luhansk. It's it's, it's not the same thing. Uh, but but but. Um, I, I clearly, I think clearly we can say in that sense that Putin has been, Putin is a nation destroyer, obviously, in, in, in the Ukrainian sense, on, on one level. On the other level, Putin is a, is a nation builder for the Ukrainian state, because, because after annexation of Crimea, uh, the Ukrainian identity has strengthened very much. And we can also see, him if, if, for example, if we take the studies by, there was an article by Volodymyr Kulik, for example, the Ukrainian political scientist, that, that uh, uh, I, I always wonder. Now, according to the census, then 17% in 2001 argued that they were Russians, right? But what does this mean? I, I don't see those Russians, especially in, say, in Bukovina, where you see some 11% are supposed to be ethnic Russian, but where are they? You, you hear the Russian language a lot, a lot more than, than like 11%. But um, there is no, I don't, I never felt that is a clear sense of Russian identity. And the, the numbers that I saw in, from, 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 Gal, from Gallups was that maybe that there exists a core group with a strong Russian ethnic identity of something like 5% of the population. So it's not, it, it's, it's not that big as you, we, we should be careful uh, about using the census numbers, I think, too much. There is a strong sense of growing Ukrainian, not ethnic, but national identity.
I, I propose to switch from ethnic discussion to the state discussion. Uh -huh. I uh, call many times that uh, Ukraine is not a real state or even failed state. But after Prigozhin's action, Prigozhin's rebellion, we see contrary that uh, Russia probably is at least half failed state or fully failed state. This is there is discussion, you know, one side yeah. says it's fully fully failed state, you know, and uh, but I support that half failed state, you know, uh, partly part, partly failed, part, partly not. But in any way, in front of uh, half failed state of Russia, we see new threats for NATO. It's very different from then uh, that uh, threats which comes from a uh, strong state, you know. Strong uh -huh. state could uh, threat uh, us, you know, by this, uh, its power. And the uh, failed state uh, threats uh, by uh, chaos, uh, chaos yeah, that, exactly. could, uh, that could uh, create. You know, and uh, this is, uh, I think, this is new challenges for NATO meeting in Vilnius as well. How we should interpret the contemporary situation and before this uh, situation of failed state, NATO countries discuss only about defense. But now it's the question about possible, po possible you know, intervention in order to save some, you know, uh, um, nuclear nuclear bases from uh -huh. chaos, chaotic countries. In How Russia. do you de yeah. yeah, Russian chaotic uh, groups, you know, who could, these bandits who, yeah. who could kept uh, this uh, nuclear weapon, mm -hmm. you know, as well. So we see completely new situation. Yeah. Uh, do do you uh, hear or do you uh, could you present uh, the discussion in Sweden on this topic? Well, it's 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 difficult to say anything conclusive on the about the discussion in Sweden here. But in 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 the general Western sense, it seems to me that uh, very often uh, those those in in Western circles who are critical towards a too tough policy on, on Russia. Uh, they use both those lines that that you mentioned, right? Uh, when 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 Russia is strong, they say that we should be careful uh, with Russia. We should not uh, challenge Russia too much because Russia is strong and dangerous. That when Russia is weak and, and chaotic, we should not challenge Russia because Russia is weak and chaotic and that's dangerous. So so so, so this is done. Uh, and I think you would find such voices in Sweden as well. But I think you, you had a you had a uh, you, you pointed to way out of it in the sense that. Uh, if Russia indeed becomes chaotic, then this this really poses a danger, right? And uh, you were thinking about nuclear bases in Russia. I would think about the uh, Zaporizhia nuclear plant, for example, right? Uh, it, some people say it's mined by the Russians, which I, I have no idea, but it might happen. Um, so uh, if there is a, a readiness for for this kind of spot action, you know, you you will you, you would take an action, not in the sense of a large scale counter invasion, but 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 this particular spot and that particular spot, then I would say that 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 that, may, that, that maybe would be very wise because um, in there, I think it would have been a much much better signal uh, to give uh, to provide, uh, for example, long shooting missiles to Ukraine. Uh, not only now, which they are maybe maybe they will do, but 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 say half a year ago and or maybe maybe even further uh, further back. Uh, and then the, the argument obviously was that we should not provoke Russia, but that does not work. That that the, they they that they don't feel Russia. They don't they don't understand how this country works. I would say. Yeah, I would uh, add, you know, that uh, a couple of days ago I had a discussion in Lithuania the television on the same topic. And we discussed not only uh, uh, Russia's a failed state and new threats uh, concerning it, but as well about the Belarusian situation, mm -hmm. you know, in the situ uh, Belarusian situation in the case of uh, weak Russia, you know, and weak yeah. Kremlin. Uh, what does mean uh, it for us? Uh, what does mean, for example, invitation of Prigozhin bandits to Belarus? Yes. Yes. Or as well to building nuclear uh, 
weapon bases in Belarus as well near Minsk, you know, or Astrov nuclear power station near Vilnius, uh -huh. uh, you know, uh, 40 uh -huh. kilometers uh, from Vilnius. There are many of threats. The same uh, but different threats are discussing in uh, Poland as well. We are doing this, it together. And this as well means uh, that we consider, started consider, not only, as I said, uh, defensive politics, but as well some uh, proactive action possible, you know, in order to defend from this bandit. Uh, uh -huh. And we don't see that uh, uh, NATO in general, except Poland, is ready, you know, yeah. for, for such yeah. kind yeah. Uh, yeah. of discussion, even it's not about actions, yeah. but about even discussion, yeah. which you mentioned as well. So we see some split, you know, yeah. in between NATO countries, uh, those who would like to support more active Latvia, Lithuania, Poland, you know, and those who are more or less passive and those who are against this active, you know, action. The, uh, so this is, we see some uh, dis disagreements, disagreements between NATO members. And how do you consider uh, that this one situation? Could it help? Uh, could it be wrong process? How could you react on this one split in NATO yeah. members' opinions? Well, I mean, I think it's it's correct. First of all, of course, I understand that for Lithuanians, what happens in Belarus is tremendously important for, for very obvious reasons. Um, I think that we have this. Um, let, let's put it like this: Northern European and Eastern European, almost like axis. Sweden and Finland also more or less belong to to to, to, to the same Baltic Polish Polish group. I was by and large, right? Uh, especially Finland, and Sweden, but Sweden too. Uh, and then on the other hand, we have uh, we have downright uh, opponents like Hungary, uh, and we have those those countries uh, that have had intimate relations with uh, Russia. I mean, like like Germany, and we, which have really began to to change their policies, but which might not be ready for 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 you know, talking about proactive measures, if this means some kind of military engagement uh, in in Belarus, for example, to yeah, to 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 to, to protect uh, NATO from this uh, the situation with Prigozhin, for example. But, um, and I mean, but we are there, there are a, a number of states uh, of important states in NATO where there is no traditional uh, his, there's no history of negative engagement with Russia, like say France, Italy, they have no tradition of having historical problems with Russia, uh, rather the other way around, you can say. It. Okay, Italy is a more complex example, but France, Belgium, you know. Uh, so I, I think, I think there is, there, there is such a division, and uh, I, I really hope that uh, and I think that one should listen more to the Eastern Europeans because this is about their security. This is not about the security of Portugal after all. Uh, Portugal is not threatened. Portugal might, maybe Portugal wants to trade, Portugal wants to do, uh, build relations in another way, but uh, the countries that are bordering Russia are, or Belarus are, are directly affected and, and, and their voice should, should be heard. And I would, I would have appreciated if the next general secretary of NATO would be a person from say Poland or Lithuania or one of those countries. Right? But we have these problems and I mean, I think it can only be overcome, it cannot be overcome in and by itself by discussion and then, then, we, then we will convince them into taking our view, that will not happen, I think. But it's the, the, the development themselves and more prigozhin like events, more chaos, and more things towards which we have to react, that might, might bring some changes on, on the, say, the French-Belgian side, but not, I'm sorry, I don't think this is about discussions in that sense. Yeah, it is, it is kind of evident that uh, uh, NATO, uh, as, an or, uh, as an organization, has uh, overcome uh, lots of uh, its own fears. If we remember uh, the way Stoltenberg was talking at the very beginning of the mm. war, 
that he was saying we will do nothing, we will not intervene, uh, kind of pacifism. Uh, so that that was uh, uh, also very similar yeah. to what Biden was saying that uh, you know uh, we're ready to help uh, um, to defend uh, uh, in case of uh, NATO territory invasion, but uh, we we are not going to do anything. And now we see that. Uh, every month there has been very significant uh, changes. Uh, yeah. uh, Heimers, uh, uh, mm. other weapons, uh, um, then tanks, then uh, uh, possibly uh, some of uh, fighter jets will get F-16. Um, every month there's a step forward. NATO seems to be much more uh, now confident and Great Britain seems to be forward with the chest pushed out as the yes. leader, yes, uh, really uh, dictating the, the, the pace uh, yes. and the uh, courage uh, not to be afraid of Russia. And uh, it seems like uh, now the spirit is uh, quite unanimous and uh, Vilnius then could be, could be really promising. What are your expectations for uh, well, in that I, sense? I think, I think you are right, but I think w w what made... NATO was more uh, careful in the beginning, but what what, com what made this change was, of course, the successful Ukrainian resistance. Uh, because I think there was, an, and we know there's a history about, I think the German foreign minister uh, expecting the uh, that Ukraine will lose out in, in, in a week or in a few days, and and, and saying that, that there's no need for us to send you anything. Uh, b because you will lose anyway. Like So the, the, the successful Ukrainian resistance has made all this development that, that, that you sketch uh, possible. Uh, the Ukrainian defended themselves with the means that they already had. And then because they made it successfully, more or less, uh, rather more, uh, meant that it became possible for NATO countries to uh, send uh, more and more important mil military help. So I, I, I will hope that this, this, this logic will continue as, and as Russia is perceived to be, to be weaker, uh maybe also they will be lesser uh they will, they will be less fierce of 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 sending for example uh the ATACM or what it's called the long long shooting missiles right hopefully yeah and uh, uh okay let's uh, return uh, to this uh, situation of sweden you know uh -huh. and now we see differences uh, between uh, finland and sweden situation mm -hmm. you know uh, and uh, as uh, how do you think uh, this was uh, finland success why uh, uh, all countries including uh, turkey and uh -huh. uh, Hungary supported Sweden, why oh, sorry, it's Finland, despite despite Finland on the border of Russia, you know. Yeah. It looks like, you know, uh, very strange. From this one position, if, if you are a Russian lover, you should accept uh, probably Sweden, but not Finland. Uh -huh. you know? Yeah, yeah. Why it's happened point. differently, you know. This is very wonderful. It's uh, very difficult to explain. What's your opinion about I Finland's think, success? Yeah, you know, Finland, uh, because of its... Uh, uh, its position, its geographical position, has all has had to take a more adult position in a way than than than, 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 than Sweden. Sweden came a bit later to this than, than Finland did, and of course because of the of, of the historical developments and the wars that are still very much in, in the memory of people. Um, I think that um, Finland is 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 seen in a way as a more pragmatic country. I mean, I, and I think it is a more pragmatic country. So. Uh, there was no sense of irritation. Uh, they were less keen on, uh, you know, in Sweden we have this expression, a moral superpower, because uh, the Swedes are very keen on that, that, that people, we know we are small, but uh, we are very wise and, and progressive. So pe people, sh pe people should listen to us because we have something important to say. The Finns are much more pragmatic. They don't they don't believe that people would necessarily listen to them very much. So they they do their thing and they support the general structures, uh, but they are less provocative maybe in, in some cases. So there was a Hungarian resistance, for example. Then, of course, um, since Finland has had a much, in comparatively much less uh, allowing migration policy, they have, uh, there are 
way, way, way lower numbers of people from other countries. They don't have a large Kurdish diaspora. They simply, those people simply do not live in Finland to, to that extent. So there, there, there is no problem uh, with kind of anti-Turkish, say Finland as a kind of anti-Turkish base or something in, in, in Turkish eyes. So they, that's also, I think, you can see this very easy. It was easier for the Turkish parliament to, to, to swallow Finland, the fin Finnish participation. And in this one, uh, from this one point, now Sweden is uh, uh, um, surrounded by uh, only NATO countries, yes. Norway, Finland, uh, yes. Denmark, and uh, on the Baltic Sea, you know. Why uh, does uh, uh, Sweden need uh, to become a member <laughs> of NATO if it is between NATO? It looks like because you sign... Uh, to sides agreement, Nordic agreement, why that's important to become, you know, member of larger because in any way you are involved in all the security systems. Right. So we can say like, and, 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 and kind of everything, everything is all right anyway. Um, yeah, well, I mean, uh, well, I mean, there is a sense of responsibility, like, like, like uh, we, we cannot uh, put our security on, on Finnish shoulders like that, or on, or not, or that, that we cannot do that. Uh, and and um, there's also a sense that this is now the right thing to do. This is an international uh, moment and movement, and, and uh, Sweden should be a part of this. I mean, uh, this you have to say, this is tremendous change in Swedish, uh, in, in Swedish political history. Like, uh, if you just take the opinion polls, like in 2021, uh, there was 29% of Swedes in, in the most reliable polls were for NATO membership, 29% were against, and then a lot of people didn't really know. Just one year later, we had like 64% uh, for NATO and only 14% against. So this, I think there has been no other question in Swedish recent, or I mean like the last 30, 40 years uh, history where we have had such a tremendous and fast change in public opinion over only one year. And that's, that's after the invasion. It says something about how important uh, this was in the eyes in, in the eyes of the Swedish population. Uh, so I, mean, I, I think there is a sense that we we, we want to be uh, a part of this, and that we are not really safe without uh, without an NATO membership. Uh, and um, uh, we have. Parts of Swedish territory, like Gotland, for example, which will be incredibly important in the case of a larger conflict in the Baltic states, for example. And we would like to be a part of this larger structure, so there were lesser temptation to send rockets. On yeah, Earth. Gotland, uh, Iceland is very important, but now I would like as well to continue the same discussion concerning to turn to the Kaliningrad district. Ah. Because you in any way involved in this Slavic and political studies. And yes. you know this uh, that many of uh, politicians don't like to discuss this Kaliningrad problem, especially in Germany. Germans always try to escape from this oh, question. You know, for okay. them it's uh, like you know some trauma, historical yeah. I see it, and they, they don't like even uh, remember like you know. Uh, uh, okay, this is yes. uh, but in any way uh, for Poland and especially for Lithuania, uh, Kaliningrad district is not uh, the traumatic but problematic, I would say, and very dangerous yeah. as well because yeah. there is uh, nuclear weapons, military bases, very aggressive uh, country, and uh, continuous uh, uh, rhetoric about building of Suvalki corridor uh, connection yeah. with. Uh, uh, with uh, Belarus, which means starting the big war between uh, NATO and Russia immediately uh, at the same uh, time. And in another way, when we're talking about Kaliningrad district, it's immediately where we uh, t uh, touches, uh, we touch uh, Gotland and Sweden as well, because yes, yes. Uh, this is very strange, but Kaliningrad defense uh, completely defend, depends from the, on the situation in Sweden. You know, it's uh, because these two uh, territories in, in front of each other, you know, that mm -hmm. looks like it's uh, and so this is uh, what is uh, the, there is uh, some is some kind of discussion about uh, Kaliningrad in Sweden or zero level. Zero, zero, no discussion. 
unfortunately, no discussion at all, I would say. Um, but but I mean, it's difficult to see what uh, what really could be discussed. I mean, um, in the case of this weakening of Russia, you know, uh, if if this really would take place, I mean, it would be wonderful for the Baltic Sea region if we had, if you used the, the, the Moscovite terminology, demilitarization of Kaliningrad, right? We should not be Putinists. We should not advocate the change of state borders and all of that. But, 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 but you know, um, demilitarization, if we got rid of the nuclear weapons on the territory of Kaliningrad, it would be, it would already be great, right? So that, that that's what, that's what one could, could hope for, uh, probably in, in, in the, in the best of cases. But I mean, if, um, Otherwise, we simply we have a we have a large problem that that, that is there and and and, and will will be there uh, without. What can we do? We, we can isolate it. We can protect ourselves and and. Uh, but with this Russia that we have now, there are none. We have, don't really have any alternatives to deal with them, except but, from defending ourselves. But but uh, even though in Sweden you do not have a discussion uh, uh, regarding Kaliningrad. Uh, area, but you probably have uh, certain um, fears about the potential occupation of Gotland Island, yeah. and uh, you just uh, got yeah. back, uh, I believe, from Gotland. Yeah. Uh, did you did you hear uh, uh, or feel uh, being there? What do locals uh, think? Do they do they have those fears because of the uh, military ships in the Baltic Sea of Russia? Uh, because uh, uh, we know that uh, it wasn't the plans uh, by Russia to uh, grab uh, Gotland as a strategic yeah. island. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, firstly, <laughs> I didn't see many locals <laughs> because this is the uh, it, it's the Almedalsbecken. It's called. It's a week where the politicians, journalists, uh, administrators, you know, uh, all kinds of people. Uh, gather in, in uh, on Gotland to, to 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 mingle and discuss no, discuss things right uh, and and um, but 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 what I what I have felt um, during this last year of course is that Gotland has been at the center of discussions about Swedish sec Swedish security so when when they, they are talking about there has been less talk about like a general Russian large-scale invasion of Sweden, but there has been talk about specific Russian operation towards Scotland. And especially the context has been, for example, a Russian invasion of, let's say, Estonia or, or, or the Baltic states in general. And uh, uh, if, you know, if the Russians con did control Gotland in such a situation, it would be very difficult for NATO countries to, to defend the Baltic states. So in the, in the, and there is an event, uh, there is clearly, but we don't, we don't have much awareness about Kaliningrad in that sense. In the public debate, at least, uh, but about this, there there is an awareness. So uh, then, this is this is one of the reasons that 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 that, that Sweden still want to have NATO membership in spite of the problems, right? Definitely. Well, thank you very much, Nicholas, for your insights. It uh, it was a great pleasure to talk to you after some time and yeah. uh, so many developments. So uh, th thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. It was a pleasure to.